Hi, I'm Denji, and in today's video, I'm doing a calm, no-nonsense guide on how to install Gen 2 Linux. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that I'm in a Linux Mint live environment over here. I'm not in the Gen 2 ISO, which you can download from the Gen 2 page. The reason for this is because Gen 2 requires no special software or specific package manager to install it onto a base system. This means that we can easily download any existing Linux live environment, in this case, Linux Mint, to make this install process much, much easier than typing everything manually on the terminal. In fact, a lot of this install is just gonna be copying and pasting commands. But anyways, without further ado, the first thing I recommend is you make yourself the root user over here on Linux Mint. So I'm just gonna run sudo su and there you go, we're now the root user. I'm just gonna type cd to make the prompt smaller. And now I'm gonna move on to the first step of the installation that matters to us at least, and that's preparing the disks. Now, if you're installing Gen 2, you should still be relatively familiar with how to partition disks and how to just lay out a Linux system before you start working on it. We're just gonna partition everything with CF disk, so I'm gonna run CF disk. And then for label type, I'm gonna pick GPT because this is a UEFI system. Since this is a UEFI system, I guess we gotta make a 100 megabyte partition here and go down and press enter and make a four gigabyte swap partition or however big you want your virtual memory. Just make that as big as your memory or twice your memory or something like that. And then the rest of the space is just gonna be root. So just press enter twice for that one. Then go over to right, type yes press enter, then over to quit. And there you go, we've partitioned our disks. Now let's format them to all the appropriate file systems. So let's just list them again, just to be sure. There they are. We're going to mkfs.ext4, then dev sda3. That's gonna be our root in the ext4 file system. And there you go. Now it's gonna be mkfs.fat dash capital F32 dev sda1 for our boot partition. And then the easiest one is just gonna be mkswap dev sda2 for our swap partition. Now it's time to mount all these things. Now one thing you'll notice in the Gen 2 guide, if you scroll down all the way to where it starts mounting stuff, is that over here it recommends you mount everything to MNT Gen 2 as a root, and not just MNT as you would on Arch Linux. That means we're gonna have to make that directory. So I'm gonna run mkdir forward slash MNT forward slash Gen 2. There you go. And then I'm gonna mount dev sda3 which is our root partition to slash mnt slash gen2 and just to be sure so i do it now i'm also going to mount my boot partition but to do that i'm going to have to create the boot efi directory just like we did on arch linux so mkdir dash p to make them recursively slash mnt gen2 boot efi and then mount dev sda1 mnt gen2 boot efi and then finally the easiest step swap on dev sda2 to turn on that swap so you run lsp okay one last time there you go everything's looking fine now moving on to the next step which is installing stage three today we're going to be doing a very minimal install and that's going to play into which stage we pick okay so we're going to run date just to make sure that the date is correct so any ssl downloads don't mess up so run date and yeah that's definitely not right it's not 2 a.m here it's actually 6 a.m i just woke up a few minutes ago so i could do this gen 2 guide i don't think a few hours like that is really gonna throw it off but if the date is completely wrong like if it says october 1st or september something here or any other date that isn't the current day then you should go into your settings and change that. I'm just gonna move on to the next step, which is choosing your stage tarball. Now, if you go over to the download section, which is linked over here, you can pick between various stage archives. So all these are, are a base Gen 2 system that's sort of been packaged into a little tar file, which you can then untar and install a kernel on and then boot from, basically. I'm gonna pick the first one, which is the stage 3 OpenRC. Stage 3 systemd, as the name suggests, includes systemd instead of openrc as the init system. System. The no multi-lib variants are the same thing, except they have no support for 32-bit programs. And the stage 3 32-bit, that's just a 32-bit version for 32-bit computers. Anyways, I'm going to pick this one over here. So right-click and copy link. And now I'm going to go into MNT Gen 2, which is where you're sort of recommended to untar it. And I'm going to run wget and then that. So just give it a sec to start downloading. This might take a while. Okay, so it's been downloaded. And now, as it says in the guide, you got to untar it. So just run this command, basically. And there you go. Tar x pvf stage 3 and the tar ball and enter. Once again, this also might take a while, depending on your CPU and disk speed. I don't know if you can hear it, but my fans have started to rile up. That's going to happen a lot. Okay, so now that it's extracted, we can move on to configuring compile options. Now, what's weird to me is that this guide to configure C++ 
flags, CSX flags, and also make OPTS flags. All of this is done before you go and modify the use flags, which is something we'll take a look at later in the guide. Anyways, we're just gonna follow the way the guide says to do it for now. We might rebel later. Nano MNT Gen 2 Etsy Portage Make.com. We want to edit this file. This is going to be the magic file to edit in this tutorial. We're going to go through this file so many times. Now, as you can see here, there's already some stuff to find in here. The only line I want to add is this one over here make OPTS. So we're going to add make OPTS and then equals and in quotation marks. You want to put dash J, then a number of processes. A good rule of thumb is you divide the amount of memory you have by two, and then round it to the lowest thread. In today's case, I've especially picked 10 gigs of RAM and five threads. So we can do dash J five, because five times two is 10, and there's enough threads for that. Make sure you lower and increase this number based off any experience you have compiling. Maybe with this increase, it's faster, or maybe it just uses too much memory in your system, memory fills up, and that kind of stuff. Anyways, we're gonna do control O and press enter, then control X and move on to the next step, which is going to be installing the actual base system. This is going to be the biggest and most complex part of the guide, so don't be ashamed if you mess something up. Anyways, the first thing is going to be selecting the mirrors. We don't really have to do this, but it's recommended to get faster mirrors than what you regularly have. And in this case, I'm going to go over to the Gen2 page, gen2.org, then go over to the downloads page then over to the mirrors section. And over here, you can get a list of all of the mirrors. I'm gonna pick any Turkish mirrors, actually. Oh yeah, there you go, there's one. I'm gonna just copy paste that URL. And then I'm gonna go into MNT Gen2 Etsy Portage Make.com. And we wanna add the variable, maybe at the bottom of the file, Gen2 underscore mirrors, and then make that equal to that mirror or any other list of mirrors which you can find online. I'm gonna write and quit and move on to the next step which is gonna be copying the DNS info. So this is basically just copy paste a command. The Etsy resolve file, if you check that on your system, this includes the name server, so the DNS server which your system is using. In today's case, we're just gonna copy that over, dereference it and send it over to the gen two root. So I'm gonna just run enter. There you go, we've copied the DNS information. This is gonna be the most tedious part of the guide. This is mounting the necessary file systems. This is just copying and pasting. Like this is not Nothing complex about it, you just copy and paste. And there's gonna be a lot of that in this guy. So just run this and paste it and run it. Copy, paste and run, copy, paste and run, copy, paste and run, and copy, paste and run. There you go. We've mounted everything. Finally, it is a warning over here that says, when not using Gen2 installation media, this might not be sufficient. Some distros make dev SHM a symbolic link to run SHM, which after the truth becomes invalid. Now this actually does happen on Linux Mint. If you run ls-l, run then SHM, as you can see, it's linked over to dev SHM. So you do want to follow this tutorial. So I'm gonna just run this stuff, then run this, and then change the mode over here. So. There you go. Now we can move on to the next step, which is changing root. Once again, this is just basic copying and pasting. You want to truth slash MNT Gen 2 or whatever mount point you're using. Then to bin bash as our shell. There you go. We're in the Gen 2 root now, except it does say mint. Our source is going to be Etsy profile. There you go. Now we've got executable programs. Basically just copy paste this part. All this really does is adds a little truit right there so we can know that we are in the truit. Mounting the boot partition, we've already mounted it. If we run LSB OK, there's everything. Now we're gonna learn how to use Portage. That's a Gen 2 package manager. The first command we're gonna learn is emerge webrsync. If you run this, emerge dash webrsync, it synchronizes the repository. So pressing enter. This might take a while to download, so I'm just gonna give it a sec. Okay, so now that we've synced the repositories, we can skip this step because it's optional and move straight to reading news items. This is going to be your introduction to the eselect command, which will be used quite a little bit in this guide. You run eselect news list. You'll see there's a few news items dating back from 2016 to 2021. And then if you wanna read any of them, just run eselect news read, and then it'll say, I wanna read the latest one, 10. And if you run that, you'll just get a raw text copy of it. So what you can do is then send that over either to a file or pipe it straight into less. And then you can go through and, and read through that if you want to. But anyways, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna go to the next section, which is choosing the right profile. Now, this is very important, depending on what kind of system you wanna get. Today, we can stick to the number one profile because I'm not really gonna be installing anything like desktop environments or Xorg or a display server. However, if you do plan to use Xorg, I recommend you pick this option over here. And you know, depending on whether you wanna use GNOME or KDE, pick one of these options. But to see the actual full list of options, you wanna run eselect, 
profile list. And there you go, we've got all the options. So it's already set the number one, which is perfectly fine by me. However, if you're, however, once again, if you want to run Xorg, you gotta choose this one. If you want to run GNOME, choose this one. And of course, there's options for all of these to have them as systemd or with no multi-lib support, like this one, for example. And there's developer and stable versions. But anyways, we're gonna stick to default because that should be perfectly fine for us. So I'm not gonna select anything. But if you did want to select one of them, you would have to run eselect profile set and then let's say five for the desktop one. And now if you run that list again, you'll see that it says that we have selected the fifth one, which is the desktop one. But I'm gonna set this to one because that's the one I want. Now, what do these profiles actually do? Well, they modify two aspects of our system primarily. Number one, the packages in the at world set. So the at world set is essentially all the packages installed quote unquote on the system, or at least the packages the system plans to update in the future. So if I picked the fifth one, for example, I would have a ton more packages to install in my world set than I would in the first one. The second thing these things change is use flags. So if you go and run this command, emerge dash dash info, you're going to get a lot of information about the current variables that Emerge is using. You can then pipe that into grep and then run this little hat symbol and use to check all of the use variables. So here they are. If you list them, I think it's just this basically. All use flags are, are different components or functions which each program is told they either need or not need. And depending on the use flags you say, you may end up installing more programs or less programs or different programs depending on the stuff that you've picked. These are the default use variables in the number one profile. If you were to pick a desktop environment, there'd be so much more stuff here. There'd be stuff like PAM and eLoginD and Bluetooth support and all this kind of stuff that your system is configured to compile. Now there's not only use flags here. There's stuff like audio cards, also cards over here. It's a whole list of different audio cards you can pick between. So just delete the ones you don't need and stuff. But how do I configure any of this? Well, it's pretty simple. If you want to get rid of any of the use flags, first of all, let's just copy paste all these and put them in our main make.com file because that's where we modify the use flags. So nano Etsy portage make.com since you know we're in the truth so we got to use Etsy not MNT Gen 2. We're going to add that use variable here. I'm just going to copy paste it and there it is. There's all of our use flags. Now the thing about use flags that makes them unique from all the other flags in the system is that if I remove one, it doesn't actually remove it from the global list of use flags because you saw before that all of those use flags were there, even though I didn't put them in this file. The only way to get rid of a use flag is to put a minus in front of it. So if I put a minus in front of, I don't know, let's say Unicode, there it is. I will not have any Unicode support, but if I just delete Unicode, I will still have Unicode support because that's how use flags work. Now it's a little bit different when it comes to different flags which are not declared. Now, one flag that's not included on the system is Bluetooth. And because it's not in that default set, which we took a look at before when we run emerge dash dash info, if I want Bluetooth support, I'm gonna have to type Bluetooth here. Same thing goes for other things. Like for example, if you want desktop support, you're gonna need PAM, eLogin D, and I think you're gonna need HarfBuzz, and a few other flags, and these are not included by default in the first set. Now, I'm perfectly fine with the default use flags, so I'm not going to change this. However, do know that when you're doing a desktop system, this becomes very, very useful because removing support for something like Bluetooth or, you know, CDs or DVDs and stuff, as soon as you do that, suddenly you're going to get a lot less dependencies to download for each package because the system knows you don't want to use those functions. Anyway, I'm just going to write and quit here and move on to the actual important step, which is updating all the packages. So if you run emerge dash dash ask and verbose and then dash dash up date dash dash deep dash dash new use and then with the at world set which once again are those packages specified when we selected our profile and press enter you'll see that it's calculating dependencies and then it's asking us if you want to update these packages we're going to say yes just by pressing enter and it's going to start compiling them but this might take a while especially if you're installing lots of desktop stuff like with the desktop you're talking about over 100 or even 200 packages you got to install not to mention kde and stuff like that so i'm just going to let this do what it needs to do and i'll be back in a sec Okay, so all the packages have been compiled over here. So we can move on to the next step, which is configuring the accept license variable. This is also something you might want to do before installing your packages, just in case you want some special proprietary software that isn't allowed by default. If we go into Etsy portage make.conf and add this variable, accept underscore license, we can give it various parameters to decide what sort of licenses we want to accept. 
So I'm just gonna put a star in here because I'm assuming most of the people watching this are not really gonna be super bothered about the license of the software. However, if you are concerned about using free software, then do put one of these various options or a, a mix of them to make sure that everything is indeed free software. Now I'm gonna do control O, press enter, control X. We can move on to the next steps. Now these are quite similar to Arch Linux, stuff like setting the time zone and locale. So you should be quite familiar with these concepts. First thing is gonna be picking a time zone. Now, if you already know your Unix time zone, you can easily just type echo, then the time zone in my case is going to be Asia slash Dubai, and then send that over to Etsy time zone, just like that. And now if we run cat Etsy time zone, there you go, it says Asia Dubai, that's good. If you run this command over here, emerge config sys libraries time zone data, and there you go, it's, it's set a correct time zone. Now locale generation is different from Arch Linux as well. Instead of uncommenting something from a file, you actually have to type it in manually. So locale.gen right over there. And we're gonna type in en underscore us dot utf dash eight and then space utf dash eight. Seems a little bit redundant, they have to type it twice, but that's just how it is. Control O, press enter, control X. Now if you run locale dash gen, it's gonna generate those two locales. There you go. And then moving on to locale selection, we have to use eselect again. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Eselect locale list and we're gonna pick locale number five. So we select locale set number five, and there you go. Now we can run this to change our profile, but we're just gonna run it as it says on the guide with this environment update command. So there you go, copy and pasting that, and there you go, we've now changed our locale. Anyways, the next step is gonna be configuring the kernel. The first thing you wanna do if you want to compile the kernel yourself is to download the kernel sources, so run this command, then going to user src, then the name of your kernels, it might be Linux, you know, dash 5.10.13 or, or something like that, right? And then from there, you can run make menu config, and then you can get a menu similar to the one that I show in my Linux compilation guide. I'll have that linked in the description. So once you get to that menu config option, you can just watch my guide on how to configure the kernel. But in today's case, we're gonna just be installing a binary kernel. So if you go over here to using distribution kernels, first of all, we have to install an install kernel. So the kind of configuration around the kernel. You can either pick one for systemd boot or for just any other bootloader. Now we're not gonna be using systemd boot because once again, we're on openrc, not systemd. So we're gonna run this command, emerge sys-kernel forward slash install kernel dash gen two. And now it's going to install the Gen 2 install kernel. Just give it a second. And there you go, it's installed. Anyway, now to actually install the kernel, the kernel is called Gen 2 kernel bin for the binary. So emerge sys kernel forward slash Gen 2 kernel bin and run that. And then it's going to start downloading it. Now, this is going to take a few dependencies. It'll take a while to download everything. So I'm going to come back in a second. Okay, so the kernel binary has now been installed. We can move on to the next step which is kernel module. Now, if you want to enable a specific kernel module, follow this guide, but UDEV, as it says in this note, will automatically enable any kernel modules you need just by checking what's supported by the hardware. So you don't really have to do this manually. This step over here, which is installing firmware, is something I definitely recommend you do if you're on physical hardware, but I'm on a VM, so I don't really have to do that. So I can skip over to the next step, which is configuring the system. So the first big thing we're gonna do today is do the FS tab. Now we could do this manually and type everything manually, but personally, I don't trust myself to manually type an FS tab. So instead, what I'm gonna do is use the gen FS tab script, which you can get from GitHub. So I'm gonna just link that in the description. So over here in this repository by Glaceon, you can go to gen FS tab, and there's a script that will automatically make an FS tab for you. So I'm just gonna download this and run it. But to do that, I'm gonna need to go back to my Linux Mint environment over here, not the gen 2 truth. So I'm gonna right click, make a new window, and just make this a little bigger, and then put this over here. And then I'm gonna just make sure I'm a super user and I'm gonna get the script. All right, so I've got the script over there. I'm just gonna make sure it's executable. So chmod plus x to nfs tab, then I'm gonna run it and then with slash mnt gen2 and it should generate an appropriate fs tab. There you go, there's an appropriate fs tab. I'm gonna send that over to mnt gen2 etsy fs tab. And now going back to my gen2 live environments, I'm just gonna close this terminal. I'm gonna use nano to go into etsy fs tab and just take a look. 
Okay, so you can ignore the red spaces, that's just it not interpreting the tabs correctly. However, this FEVRFS, none and TraceFS, we can get rid of that because those are just mounted temporarily. So we can delete all of those, just make sure those are gone because you don't really need them to boot into the system. The important stuff is you have the dev SDA1, SDA2, and SDA3 over there. Anyway, pressing enter and right quitting, move on to the next step after this which is networking information. Now, this is only really useful if you're manually configuring the network. I'm gonna be using an ethernet cable, so I'm perfectly fine. The only tool I need is DHCPCD, which we will install later. However, one thing we definitely do wanna do is set our host name. So if you go nano etsy conf.d, then host name, I'm gonna change this name to, I don't know, a fun little computer name, gentui. There you go, Gen 2 -way. Press enter, you know, write and quit that. Then you can configure things like your domain and stuff. I, I don't really need any of that, that should be fine. The hosts file is important to configure. So nano Etsy hosts. Then I'm gonna add a line in here. It says 12700.1 and then with my host name, so Gen 2 -way. Now setting the root password. Now Gen 2 is interesting because it requires a certain complexity to your root password. You can change this, but you know, having a complex password is good. So I'm gonna set one. So password, I'm gonna type a complex password. It does suggest one for you. There's tech39bleak. I don't really know what that's meant to mean, but you know, you can have that as your password if you really want it. Oh, it, do it doesn't match. I'm gonna type it again then. Lovely seven cruel Joseph. What are these words? And now there's in it in boot configuration. We can basically skip this unless you want to specify a different key map or you want to change your hardware clock stuff. Now we can move on to installing tools. Now here you're recommended to install various things. The big thing you probably want is the DHCP client. So we're gonna run emerge DHCP CD. And then I'm also going to want out of my system, I might want sudo so we can have super user privileges and stuff. And I guess, you know, just for fun, we can have screen fetch just so we have something, something funky to look at. And of course we want grub because that's going to be our boot manager and EFI boot MGR. That's going to be useful for having EFI work on our system. Anyways, just pressing enter. It should start merging those packages. Just give it a second. It might take a while because there's 16 things to install. I'll come back in a minute. Okay, so now that all those packages have been installed, we can move on to the next step, which is configuring the bootloader. Now, we don't even really need to read this section because I'm pretty sure if you've installed Arch Linux, you're probably quite familiar with installing a bootloader. But just to be sure, I'm just going to check through this. And yeah, it's, it's basically the same. We're going to run grub dash install dev sda to install it first of all also make sure you do have that efi boot manager package that i installed before because without that your system is not going to boot then we're going to run grub dash mkconfig dash o forward slash boot grub grub dot cfg press enter and there you go it made our grub config and once again that os prober error we can just ignore that because we're not dual booting now that that's all done we can move on to the next step we're not going to reboot the system now because there's a few more things i want to do and that's create our user and set him as a super user so before you know that we've installed the sudo package we want to make sure that all users of the wheel group have access to super user privileges so we're going to run editor equals nano then vsudo, then as you can see, here's the Etsy sudoers file. We're gonna go all the way to the bottom and uncomment the iconic line, wheel all equals all all. And there you go. Now, now wheel users can run commands with pseudo privileges. So control O, press enter, control X. And now we can finally add a user. And this is just the same as on Arch Linux. It's user add dash M dash G. We're gonna add us to the wheel, to the users group. And if you want video and audio and everything, you can do video, audio, USB, all these different groups. But I'm not going to have that because we're just going to be using a base terminal install. We're not going to be doing any extra good stuff. Our shell is going to be bash. And then our username is going to be Denshi. So there you go. We can, we can ignore that mailbox file thing. Now we're going to change our password. And now I'm going to set it for Denshi. So Denshi. I'm going to just set the same password, although... In real life, you might want to set different passwords for these two different accounts. But the last thing you want to do is do some disk cleanup, maybe. So go into your root directory. There's still the stage three there. So let's just remove that rm-rf stage three. And, and there you go. We've pretty much done everything we really need to set up this Gen 2 system. So now if we exit and exit again, we're back in Linux Mint. I guess we can just quickly unmount all, just to unmount everything. We could ignore the fact that they're busy because we're not really doing anything on these different things. And now we can run reboot. Okay, here we are in Grub. There's Gen 2 Linux. Press enter and see if that 
boots up, so just give it a sec. There's OpenRC booting up, and, and there's a small text, and there's our login. That was quite quick. Now I'm gonna type Denshi, and then my password over here. And there I am in Gen 2. I'm just gonna make that text bigger, so set font, then uh, dash D to make my font twice as big. And, and now, just, just for fun, like we always do on these tutorials, we're gonna run screen fetch, and there you go, there's there's Gen 2, how beautiful. Now if you wanted to install Xorg and set up a graphical environment, you'd have to run this command, so just go into edit portage make.conf, there you go, type my password in, just to make sure that sudo is working, I guess, yeah, it's it's working. And then go down to use, and you wanna add a few things here, probably wanna add X for Xorg support, PAM for PAM support, you log in D for logging in support, and you know, permission support, and harf, buzz for all that kind of support and I think true type as well and a few other things and but I'm not going to install Xroke today because I'm just doing a base gen 2 install but if you did want to install it do know that you're going to need a, a few various use flag changes and there might be a few hurdles on the road with those use flags if you're ever stuck the best way is to just google your answer or maybe ask me send me an email or write something in our tech support chat which is on matrix discord and xmpp anyways besides that I've been Denshi. That was a Gen 2 install done as calmly and simply as possible. Goodbye.